Good morning. My name is Justin. Welcome to my channel. I play guitar on songs in Nashville. Today uh, I want to talk about a few things, mostly related to the last video. First I want to go through a bunch of the comments. I want to talk a little bit about Chris Isaac's Wicked Game. And then I want to answer the question, is my band going to get in trouble if we use the same chord progression as this other famous song? If you haven't subscribed, you should, especially if you're a guitar player or if you're just a musician. I think a lot of the things that I share on this channel are valuable to musicians in general, but it's, it's always coming from the perspective of a guitar player, right? My goal is to help people be the kind of guitar players that other musicians who don't play guitar want in their bands or on their records, right? So that's the deal. Let's talk about the last video and the comments. I just want to say thanks to everybody. The overwhelming majority of those comments were so encouraging. That band is like riding high. <laughs> They're just feeling really good, you know. I think they still check the video and are, you know, Tim is going through and responding to certain comments. That's the guitar player from the band that sent the song in to for me to give thoughts on, you know. Uh, I had I had a lot of comments saying that his playing reminded them of Mark Knopfler, and in the video I said, like, David Gilmore or Dickie Betts. But yeah, totally, totally Knopflery, <laughs> Knopflerish. Not sure. Um, but yeah, definitely, very much can hear that. There was also a lot of positive things said about the singer, and I totally agree. He sounded great. I didn't have any, any uh, criticisms for the vocalist. Uh, some people said um, he sounded like Warren Haynes, which I totally get. Uh, people were saying that the song reminded them of One by U2 or um, Wicked Game was a was a big, big comparison. There were a lot of comments saying, oh yeah, that sounds a lot like Wicked Game. And I get that, and we will get to that in a little bit. Um, but let's, let's respond to some of the comments. There's like over 700 comments on the video. And again, thank you so much for being so positive and encouraging and the overwhelming amount of criticism that was offered was constructive like i asked so thank you you guys really made um a very informative and useful comment section on the video like that just makes the video that much more valuable to people i think so thank you from me all right so uh first comment um, Danny Canchola, 9838. I hope I didn't just butcher your last name, Danny. Um, I watched this video thinking I was going to unsubscribe afterwards. Uh, just too many guitar channels to keep up with. Yeah, yeah, it's saturated. I hear you there. But this was excellent. This wasn't a reaction video. This was a straight-up music lesson for guitarists and bands who want to write their own songs. I'm glad you didn't shy away from saying things that were not relevant but could maybe hurt feelings. You stated your opinions with tact, and it all sounded insightful and useful. I hope you do more of these. I hope so, too. Um, you know, I know the thumbnail and the title were a little uh, grabby, shall we say. Um, I am trying to play the YouTube game to some extent, right? Trying to grow the channel. So I'm glad you didn't uns unsubscribe, and I'm glad that the overwhelming majority of people took this video as I meant it. Like, when you actually get into the video, oh... This is actually really cool. It's not just another, whoa, my mind is blown, you know, um, big reaction thing. So next comment that I wanted to respond to. This is from Rusty Axelrod. This is one day ago. Enjoyed the song and the critique. I would like to address the indistinct observation on the second solo. Listening to my own playing, I've made an effort to be indistinct for a phrase or two on purpose. Clear and precise can be less interesting than a solo that almost falls apart and then resolves to a clever new phrase. Maybe just my taste, but that doesn't come easy for me, and I enjoy it when it's done well. Um, and then he goes on to say, To me, this song sounds a lot like Government Mule. I've never heard them on the radio, but they're a great band that I might not like as well if they wrote for airplay. Good and radio certainly aren't synonymous. Man, I agree with literally everything this guy said. Um, good in radio, not synonymous. Not every amazing song is going to be right for radio. And radio, due to its format, excludes a lot of great music, like, by default. So, 100% agreed. Um, but also, his comment on phrasing, I think what he's saying is, like, sometimes I try to paint myself in the corner, 
and um, the the chaos and the almost coming off the railsness of it adds an energy, you know. And then when you land on your feet, it's like this really great payoff. And yes, that's very effective, and that's a very much more advanced thing. So thank you for that comment. Um, next, hi Justin. I think the song of Tim's group is really good, and your critique is excellent. My only thought is that parts of it sound like the song Ooh, That Smell, and parts of it sound like a Bob Dylan song. Could there be any issue with copyrights if parts are similar to an existing song? I know everyone borrows or is influenced by others. Just a question. Thanks, Don G. Excellent question. And yes, there are certain times when you need to, need to change what you're doing because you're infringing on someone else's intellectual property. And there's times when you're not, and I will get to that in a little bit. Next comment. This one was just, this was great. Uh, Jerome Jeffrey, two days ago. Gentlemen, I've served in many dad bands. I've known other dad bands. I've had dad bands with friends of mine. Gentlemen, this is no dad band. Very nicely done. <laughs> I, I like it because it's very complimentary, but it also assumes that a self-described dad band, like that's negative, you know? And I know Tim was being very self-effacing when he said, hey, we're just amateur dads doing this in our spare time. It, it could be a term of endearment, like, oh man, I, I relate to that. You know, I've got a band with some friends and we get together on Thursday nights and, and play a bunch of blues or something like that. Like, that's so great. Like, music is so therapeutic and helpful and... Um, necessary it's completely necessary this is necessary for survival i think having having some way of communicating that doesn't rely on us to form uh coherent thoughts you know um it just helps you kind of rearrange things that are out of whack inside of you you know i think it's a huge gift so anyway thank you for that comment jerome last comment jimmy 5634 two days ago I don't necessarily agree with the playing over comment. This song is reminiscent of Chris Isaac's Wicked Game. In fact, it could even be lawsuit material if it were released into the marketplace. Anyway, the guitar is playing the vocal melody over the top of the vocals throughout the song in Wicked Game. Listen to it and you'll see. It's actually done quite a bit in other songs as well. So there's a few things here um, that I want to talk about. Yes, there are parts in Wicked Game where the guitar is playing at the same time the vocal is singing. And throughout the verse, um, I really feel like he's doing what I suggested that Tim's band does, you know? The guy that played that, Carlton Wilsey, or, or gosh, I'm probably butchering his name too, um, Strat into a Silverface Twin with some really creative post effects that were really, really great. Some reverb and some delay. It does not sound like it's coming through the front of the amp to me, but I might be wrong about that. He plays, first of all, here, let's just, let's take a left turn and do a, just a short guitar lesson. Here's how I play the intro to Wicked Game. I'll show you how to do it with a whammy bar and without, okay? So, um, first, the chord progression, it's the same as Tim's band song. It's like a two minor, a one, and a five. It's the same thing a step and a half down, or three frets down. So instead of D minor, C, G, in Tim's song, and his hook is... Instead of that, it's, uh, it's B minor, A, E. And the hook goes... It's really crazy. And the first time I heard it, I was like, what in the world? A lot of whammy bar work. So you, you hit the down a half step and then play the note and let the, let the bar back up. And the second time he goes, rakes into this note the single note line, um, E, D, C sharp, B. And then the end of it is, is. The back half of the intro, I think is almost as tricky as the front half. The, the delay and the reverb make it sound like 
things are ringing together more than I think they really are. But it's kind of like a uh, you're playing a B minor. And then an A chord. Then an A sus. Down to the E. And then when the vocal comes in, he pre-bends into the B minor, right? Like it's dipped down, and then as you rake, it comes back up. And he does play while the singer's singing. But th that song actually illustrates the point I'm making. It is not contradicting what I'm saying. He's just playing while the, while the, the vocal's going, the singer, Chris Isaac, And then he steps out. And then there's a... And so, like, the phrase, the vocal phrase, Guitar answer, right, in the breath of the vocal phrase. He's doing the same thing that I'm telling Tim to do. And uh, I'm trying to think if there are any parts where the guitar literally doubles what the vocalist is singing. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. But I think the chorus is he goes back to something similar as the B section of the intro. Something like that, right? So the point, I guess to, to put a finer point on what I was saying uh, to Tim, um, it's not that you can't play at all while the singer is singing. It's that you should stay away from competing melodies, right? And in Tim's band's case, in that song, that second verse, while the singer's singing, he's doing... Like that's a that's a you know a kind of syncopated, arpeggiated. It's high. It cuts through. You've got the vocalist and the lyric and everything. And then there's ba 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 at the same time. That's where you run into competition. You're you're not you're not um, supporting the lyric as much as you're creating another melody um, that's competing with it. You know. It would have been different if, if he was just going. Right? And then the last, when the singer's done singing, some little arpeggio flourish. I mean, that's, that's a good way to handle that, you know? It's not that you can't play behind the singer. It's that um, you shouldn't play competing melodies, right? Something that distracts. New, interesting, melodic information at the same time as the vocal. That's a rule I pretty much never break. I talk about rules I have and how I break them with impunity all the time in different contexts. That one, um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think I do. I don't think I, don't think I ever come up with some competing melody that's gonna stick out and and cause some sort of like where where's my focus for the listener you know so last point and then i'm going to wrap this up is your band in danger of a lawsuit for having a song that sounds similar to a famous song i don't think tim's band is in danger in any way even if this song goes out to spotify you know say <laughs> say some say some bigger youtube channel watches the video and is like hey I want to give these guys an even bigger reach or say it gets out on Spotify or whatever. There's, there's nothing there that, that is going to uh, be grounds for a lawsuit. To me, I'm no lawyer, but I'm pretty sure um, that you have to have the same melody. Similar chord progression or the same chord progression is not enough. You cannot copyright a chord progression. Thankfully, right? Imagine if you were the guy or girl who owned the 12-bar blues. <laughs> if, you, 
If everybody had to split royalties with you or pay you to use a 12-bar blues, you'd be one of the wealthiest people on the planet, right? So thankfully, you cannot copyright a chord progression. So the fact that they're playing the same progression as Wicked Game, it's not even in the same key, but it is the same minor, down a whole step to a major, and then, um, you know, a fourth down uh, the four chord of whatever your minor one was. Now I'm talking like that other commenter. It's a two minor one five. You can't copyright that. Like in jazz, you can't copyright a two five one, right? You can't copyright a 12 bar blues. Um, how many pop songs do we hear on the radio now that are... I mean, using that beat. We call that beat the Coldplay beat because it seemed like they popularized it back in the early 2000s, late late 1990s, you know? You can't copyright a beat either, you know? And music is such a a thing of inspiration and I feel like most people get into it because they have some intense reaction, positive reaction, to a song that blows their mind. Like, how in the world? Why am I feeling the way I feel? That was amazing. Why do I like that so much? And they get an instrument and they try to figure it out, right? We all get into it in some sort of reactionary capacity is what it, what it seems like. And we all have the same 12 notes, you know? I know people have made comments like, man, my guitar don't have those notes on it. Well, it does. <laughs> They're, all the same notes are available to everybody. It's just, uh, it's where you put them, how much time you've put into being able to put them where you want. You know, all that to say, if you've got if you've got your own band on the side or whatever, and you're making music that that is based on music that inspires you, which is how literally everyone gets into this, I don't think you have to worry. You know, unless you're doing the same thing. Like if if Tim's Tim's band had the exact same intro melody from Wicked Game, or if the vocalist was uh, doing the same vocal melody in the chorus, like yeah. Yeah, you get enough if it gets big enough and gets noticed like sure. That could be that could be grounds for um for having to split royalties or pay someone's because you infringed on their intellectual property, right? So I told you I'd show you a second way to play that intro. People with uh tellies or you know, hardtail guitars or whatever, they will play wicked game by going um So you pre-bend, this is your note, you want to pre-bend to that. So you're starting B and F sharp, right? So you play it a half a, a fret down and bend out of the first note and into the second. Does that make sense? It's like having the... Yeah, I didn't hit the second note very well there. And coming up into the second note, so you can... And if you're trying to put vibrato on an open string, you can do that, you know? Um, and then the second time... I'll do a thing here, this is very subtle, um, but I'll, I'll put vibrato just on the one note. So the, the E is staying, but I'm adding a little vibrato just to the G sharp. I don't know, because it sounds cool, you know? It's just something I do. I, I'm, my left hand is never staying still. I'm constantly, you know, because all the melodies in my head are from either expressive guitar players or horn players or, or, you know, mostly it's from singers. And singers have so much emotion and inflection and vibrato and character to the notes that they play, you know? That's the whole thing. This needs character. What if the intro to Wicked Gamer just... I mean... Uh, that's nowhere near as cool, right? It's different ways of getting in and out of those notes and adding vibrato in places. You know, vibrato at the end of a phrase, 
very vocalist thing to do, right? So anyway, I hope all this helps as well. Thanks again for the um, just really positive community of commenters that you all have been. Um, I know that band is riding high <laughs> on all the comments. And I'm, I'm with y'all. There were a ton of comments. I can't wait to hear how they record this. We will revisit it for sure. There's one last thing. I've been sent some songs to do this with. And, you know, Tim approached me in a consulting context. It wasn't originally like, hey, will you put this on the channel? Uh, he said, hey, I would pay you for your time to give me some feedback because I've worked really hard and I want to see where someone who does this day in and day out thinks that I am. I feel like those comments that I offered and the criticisms and, and you know, encouragements that I offered, that's all in the capacity of a producer. That was very much a producer thing to do. In the studio, we would flesh that out together, you know, um, over the course of however long it took to record the song. I have too many friends who do that for a living um, to feel right about offering that kind of coaching for free. I, I, you know, I have friends who've worked decades to get to where they are and able to make a living, you know, and I don't, I don't want to offer that service just as a way to like, oh man, I want a lot of views, you know. Um, I do think it could be a really cool series for the channel. And if you're serious about a song that you have, email me. I charge a very small fee. It's very small. I just don't feel right about doing that totally for free. You know, if that means that people send me fewer songs, then great. <laughs> I basically just charge the same as I charge for an overdub from my house. You're welcome to email me. You can find it on my channel if you look hard enough. <laughs> and I'll see you guys later. Have a good one.